Hello and welcome back inside the park for May for podcast number 759. This is Todd. No, Todd, not that. AKA Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you, you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's exactly what I need you to do tonight. For your kind consideration, we're going to cover some news in Formula One. But before covering that news, I have to introduce my guest tonight, which of course means. That's right. I got to go all the way to the right coast of America, nestled in our nation's capital, where she does really important things for really important people about really important topics. You know her. You love her. It's the lovely, the redoubtable Grace. Grace, how you doing? That's exactly what it says on my resume. That's right. <laughs> how do you know? That's right. That's right. Yes, it says really important Grace, stuff. dark princes of st- statistics. Yes, that's right. Yes, I like it. Yeah. Ah, I'm Grace, doing, been? It's been I'm, a little while since you've been on the cast. It's been like eight weeks. <laughs> I know. Everybody's like, okay, dude, that's a lot of Charlie, okay? I mean, this get prepared, a lot people. of Charlie. You didn't know that those, like, quad headers was going to mean that's what's going to happen, right? Like, get prepared. Um, We're like, oh, wait a minute. Triple headers mean triple Charlie? Wait yeah. a minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this is my first time recording with you in your new digs. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You haven't uh, you haven't recorded yet. That's right. Yeah. With, with the, yeah. Well, I'm still not done. I still got a bunch of junk to put on my my shelf and and uh, and all that good stuff. There so you go. Done. But but it, so it's a little funny, Grace. Only you could appreciate this, having been my longtime uh, co-host. Yeah. Only you could appreciate uh this so over here is my cup right there that white one you got me yeah about nick heidfeld right right okay first white car over there nick heidfeld BMW, so nick heidfeld jordan nick heidfeld <laughs> over here i thought it was lost but i found it yes anybody can tell me what that is that's the sauber nick yes heidfeld. Right? Look at that. Everybody's like, dude, were you really that big of a Nick Heidfeld fan? No, I like Nick, but but uh, there's a little secret. So all of his teammates in those cars, those cars were a lot more expensive because they yeah. had those really, you know, celebrity uh, teammates. But the Nick Heidfeld cars, they were cheaper. So you just got Yeah, those. you know, that Rubens Barrichello brown is a lot cheaper than the right. Jensen Button. Right, 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 right. Yeah. You know, so if you're looking at the Ferrari 2004 and you could get the Rubens or the Michael, the Michael's always more expensive than the Rubens. Right, so. right. So I went with Nick Heidfeld. So I got the cars that I wanted, the Sauber, the BMW, Jordans, you know, it's cool. Huh. On the cheap, I might add. Nick Heidfeld. There you go. There yeah, you all I it. have is, uh, you know, a Thanksgiving themed banner that oh, I did. Oh, yes. Look at that. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. I like that. That's very My nice. office. Since, you know, I really never leave here now. So yeah. <laughs> I do what I can. Yeah, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. So, Grace, we have some sad news uh, to cover we do. on tonight's yes. podcast. Yes. It's a bit of a downer. Um, but, uh, the know. news that just broke uh, the last, uh, what, 48 hours is that yeah, Sir yeah. Frank Williams has passed. Yeah. And, uh, born in 1942. He was 79 years old, passed uh, this in the last couple of days. And um, so that news broke. And certainly um, there have been uh, a lot of immediate, you know, press stories. And, you know, I posted something quickly uh, about that. But, um, in the last day or so, I've been reading a, a lot of great obituaries, a lot yeah, of great uh, mm-hmm. remembrances, right, of Frank and yeah. and uh, people just recalling and sharing their stories uh, and great write-ups about, you know, Frank Williams and in his history, his past, his successes, the, the team, lots of great stuff. And I don't want to sort of, you know, retread those paths. Those are great. I urge you to go read those. They're fabulous. Uh, but I thought tonight on the podcast, what we might talk about is just a few of the moments that you and I recall about Frank. You know, there's yeah. there's certainly Peter Windsor could wax poetic about him. A lot of the drivers mm-hmm. like Valtteri Bottas and, and George Russell and the people that drove for him could share lots of stories and stuff. But as two fans that have watched uh, Frank for, uh, in my case, for years and and, um, and just share our thoughts about Frank. And, and I was going to share some kind of moments that if you're perhaps a little newer 
to Formula One, um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the the remembrance pieces will go and talk extensive about their history and kind of things that went through uh, where you can learn a lot about Frank and the footprint that he left uh, on Formula One. But if you're newer, I want to talk about just sort of the, the more recent past and kind of what he went through and what the team went through and just some inflection points that I can recall that's maybe a little closer than going back to 1977, right? Um, uh, because if I go back to 1977, those the newer fans F1 will be like, you know, uh, and I, I don't want to do that. So, um, so anyway, yeah, this, I want to get your initial thoughts, uh, Grace, go ahead. I was going to say not this early in the podcast anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah, give us about an hour, and then I may be able to... So in 1979, Frank Institute... Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And he hired... You that's know, the best. And so, yeah. So, anyway. I mean, so, I yeah. mean that's... Mm -hmm. Go no, ahead. I, I was just going to say, that's really when I... I mean, I didn't really start watching Formula 1 until the early 2000s. So that's... Right, that's the Frank Williams I know, right? Yes. The early days with Ralph Schumacher and you and Pablo... Uh, you together. and Pablo. Yeah, yeah those guys. Um, or know. as you and I call it, JPM or JIPM. JIPM. Yes. That's right. That's right. So, yes. I mean, I think the thing is that um, he's all, I guess it's it's one of those things like, you know, when somebody walks in the room and even if you don't know who the hell that person is at all, you mm -hmm. know that somebody, you know, I think definitely Frank carried himself that way, but always seemed to be such a like a nice person too. Like, you know, you could just chat with him for hours if you didn't know who he was and he'd chat mm -hmm. with you. And then later you'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe that's who that was. So I just always seemed very genuine, loved the sport and, uh, you know, literally gave up all of his life almost to it. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He, he yeah. was, um, I was, I was thinking about it um, yesterday and I was thinking about his entire life and passion was Formula One. Yeah. And he was singular minded about that. You know, um, I think I knew who Frank was or in my mind and the articles I've read, the interviews that I've seen and heard. Um, I think I, I felt like I knew who Frank Williams was, but it wasn't really until that Williams documentary on Amazon came mm -hmm. out that I was like, Wow, you know, he's almost like, um, you know, just just OCD and his singular focus on one thing, which is Formula One. And um, he was sort of that that old school British, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, he stiff upper lip, you know, absolutely passionate about Formula One, tenacious as hell. Um, he was a, a great athlete uh, before his accident. You know, he ran. Uh, he was in great shape, all of that, just tenacious as hell, you know, in finding sponsor money, finding people to, to, to mm -hmm. uh, you know, to invest in the team. And, um, and the Williams documentary, while very revealing about his dogged determination to compete in Formula One and be in Formula One and do what he did in Formula One, it was hard to not watch the credits roll of that and realize the price that his family paid for that, right? It, it was difficult not to, I felt really sorry for, for Claire because I felt like Claire wanted that connection, that heart connection. Mm -hmm. So, but he's not, he was not a guy that wore his heart necessarily on his sleeve or he certainly didn't come across that way. Um, and uh, and I've read interviews with certain people that said, you know, yeah, everybody loved in the paddock, uh, but he, you know, he could be hard on his drivers, he could be hard on yeah. his team. And you remember, Grace, there was a lot of times no compromising. I remember us talking yeah. in podcasts way back when, you know, in 07 or so, and, you know, he didn't get hung up around the axle in, in the emotions of having a particular driver or not. They'd come and go, whatever. This is right. the team. This is Williams. You're either going to drive for the team. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Damon Hill. You just won a world championship. I'm letting you go. You know, tough. Um, and it was always interesting and in just how cut and dry he could be with those decisions. Um, so I found that really interesting anyway. I thought that was uh, uh, an interesting insight. If you haven't seen that, um, yeah, you ought to go check it out now. 
Yeah. Yeah. I have a good summation. Yeah. So I thought we'd just go through. Uh, I just have a few things, and sure. if if you've got some thoughts, feel free to jump in and share them. But um, one of the one of the moments I remember about Frank and Williams is the uh, the infamous water cooled breaks. Now, in fairness, when the turbo engines start to come into Formula One, there was a real pace advantage that they had over the normally aspirated engines, and it was difficult for the British privateers to keep up with that innovation. So they found uh, that with their normally aspirated engines, they could actually run lower weights in the car. And if they ran underweight, then the normally aspirated engine would be on par with the turbo, right? They would be as quick. And so, but they'd have to contravene the rules in order to do that. So in fairness, uh, the answer was to introduce the so-called water-cooled brakes. That it wasn't just Williams; it was Williams, McLaren, and Brabham that developed this. And the concept was that they would add a tank on the car, a large tank of water, but that tank was effectively ballast. So when they'd top off the tank, the car met the weight limit. Right now, that complied with the weight limit. But when the race started, they just dumped all the water somewhere in the general area of a tire, and they just dumped all the water out, making the car much lighter and much faster and underweight, and they were able to beat the superior turbo-powered cars. Um, And then after the race, the cars would be topped off with water again prior to the post-race inspection, Mm -hmm. leaving them in compliance with the weight restrictions. And so it was a bit of... of, uh, you know, the, the shell and pea game, but it was a brilliant strategy because they told the yeah. FIA, no, 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 our brakes would get really hot. And we think that we put this watering system on, we can inject water onto the brakes, keep those brakes cool. So we're not overheating brakes and it's safer. The cars are more, you know, better performance, yada, yada, yada. And everybody bought it until they dominated the first couple of races and everyone else started complaining that didn't have oh, it. The know. turbo guys were complaining and they were saying, oh, okay. So then they banned it, right? Right. Uh, but it was a it was a very in- innovative way to take the fight to the turbo cars in the early days. Anyway, it was great. That's right, and I think I think especially when you're a privateer team, that's where you have to succeed, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like whenever there's a one-off track or early in the season, right? Like anywhere a little skullduggery is going to pay off, you've got to take advantage of that because yeah. uh, you know you you don't have you don't have the ability to wait for everybody to catch up because then they're going to beat you. So yeah. Uh, yeah, anywhere you can do that kind of thing. But yeah, that's always a, yes, it's a, I was just thinking as you're saying that, like, there's some part of like, we, we talk about, you know, Christian Horner and Toto Wolf right now. And it's like, hmm. you know, I feel like, you know, like uh, parents, you know, when kids, when teenagers think they're clever and the parent is like, like you invented this, right? Yeah, like correct. you don't think I did these things. My friends didn't do these things. You didn't invent these things. I was once a teenager too, right? That's how I feel about these things. Like, this is not new, right? Like this sort yeah. of like, you know, what can I get away with? What I always, I, you know, or the like, uh, you know, just asking for a friend. But if I put this on my car, would it be legal, right? No, uh, Ferrari, That's, yes. You know, right? So these are always yeah. uh, the tactics. And so I think this is just, you know, an example of the like, you find that loophole and you've got to exploit it as long as you can. And if everybody's going to kind of go, well, you know, it's fine. It's Williams. What threat are they? And then they go, Oh, you can't have that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. They were a big threat. Uh, no doubt about it. The other, the other kind of uh, inflection point for me, Williams was back in 2009. Mm-hmm. And in 2009, you recall that Braun GP had just purchased the team from Honda. So Honda, BMW, Toyota all left the, the series at the end of 2008. So Braun bought the team from Honda for like a pound and he showed up with this incredibly innovative dual diffuser, but, and he's usually the Braun GP is credited as the team that invented the dual diffuser and showed up and really caught everyone off guard. But there was actually three teams that showed up with a dual diffuser. Braun of course was one of them, but so was Frank Williams. Williams had the dual diffusers as, as well as Toyota, right? And um, so what they were saying that I remember at the time um, there, so you had three teams that had it 
and seven teams that didn't and and the three teams completely caught the other seven teams on their heels right and i remember at the time there was some conspiracy that at the time that that toyota had hired some honda employees who helped them and their partner williams out with the design so you had the honda team they leave the sport braun buys it there was some uh, noise that honda had hired some people from our Toyota had hired some people from Honda. And then as Toyota was exiting, they helped Williams out too, uh, with their um, dual diffuser. So you had Braun and, and Williams with the dual diffuser. And at the time, um, I remember interviewing Gary, well, we I say I it wouldn't me but we the website interviewed Gary Anderson. And he was very much against, he thought the FIA made the wrong decision in allowing the dual diffuser. And um, he made some very compelling reasons for that. But anyway, that dual diffuser was interesting. Now in the hands of the Braun, it reaped a world uh, championship. Um, but, but Williams did pretty well with it. Um, and so I thought that was an innovative part, again, where Williams was that underdog, you know, and that's a thing, Grace. Yeah. You're a McLaren fan. I've always been a Ferrari fan, but I don't think I've ever met anyone that didn't want Williams to come back from the abyss. Absolutely. I mean, I've said that a million times. Like, if we could like will a team into success, yeah. it would be Williams, and it's been that way for 15 years now. It has. It has. You it know, absolutely has. I think it's the team we all we all root for. You know, mm -hmm. they were like the consummate underdog after the. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after their championship winning form went away and and then when they were they sank so low and everybody's like oh come on williams you know come yeah. on and, you know then it became you know just so painful every race it was like oh my gosh and you had to thank frank and that's what begat you know his the sound body i always use <laughs> you know frank in the right. back like, oh my gosh what's going on you know but it was um yeah, it was these innovative points. And I've got another example that will flip this concept on its head in a minute. Um, so I thought that that was, that was very interesting, um, the dual diffuser anyway, and, and mm -hmm. a great uh, inflection point in 2009. Um, a couple other things I thought about, uh, the BMW era. So in 2003, Frank was a guy who didn't really pander to drivers or partners or right. uh, anything like that. And when B, when the BMW relationship that they had had provided 10 wins in six season, one could start to see this trajectory of success with the combination mm -hmm. of both of them. But when they missed out on the constructor's title in 2003 because they had a DNF for Juan Pablo at the Japanese Grand Prix, BMW boss Mario Thiessen, Mario Amber. Remember that guy? That's right. I remember that guy. <laughs> D Matt, as we called him. D Matt. Uh, um, he decided to leave Williams, take BMW away from Williams, and purchase Sauber and try to go their own way, which ultimately failed, and BMW eventually left the sport in 2008. Now, it's one of those moments that defined Williams and one that you would have thought Frank might have tried a lot harder to keep things rolling because once BMW left, that was really the beginning of the end. That that was starting. That was the fall of Williams uh, from their pinnacle, their zenith in Formula One. It began mm -hmm. right there, and they still haven't recovered to this day uh, from right. that era. And you can draw a line between the change in F1. And this inflection point for Williams, as the sport also moved away from title sponsors and all of that advertising money and tobacco money and big title sponsors, the sport moved away from that and became heavily reliant on prize money in the Constructors' Championship. And it still is that way yeah. to this very day. And Williams, because they started sinking lower in the constructors, it was less and less prize money. And you and I have talked right. about it. It's almost like this death spiral that you the prize money isn't there. If you finish a couple of places lower, you have less prize money. Then you finish a couple of places lower because you can't afford to develop. And then right. you finish lower and less money, less money. And eventually you get shoved out the back, you know. Um, yeah. And it was a difficult time. 
at that point um, to go through that. Uh, and it, that prize money just, you know, disappeared or evaporated, uh, leaving very precious few dollars of prize money in which to survive as a team. Um, yeah. It, go ahead. I was going to say it's kind of like only paying the minimum balance on your credit card. Yeah. Right. You're going to keep moving forward, but you're never going to get out from any sort of debt because you're just paying that, you know, $15 every month. And right. Just right. enough to keep you afloat, but it's not really a good survival strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we had talked about this in the past uh, through the different kind of iterations of Williams and the in the late noughties and then the, the early 2010s, you know, we talked about, you know, for Frank, it, it, Frank used to be really good. Williams used to be really good at going out and finding that sponsorship money. You know, they had good marketing. Uh, they, he was one of the guys that sort of pioneered the whole going to the Middle East and getting Middle East money right. into Formula One and into the team. And he was really good at that at finding that. Um, but when that all went away, um, it almost became with Frank that it, he, he was very cautious. And I think Claire was equally this way at the end of the day, it ceased to be Williams, the championship winning team. And it's and it kind of sort of seemed like anyway, on the outside looking in that it was Williams, we just need to do enough to make sure that everybody has a salary. This is a business. Right. We're going to keep everybody employed, keep the lights on. We're going to develop a car. We're going to make our own car. Yeah, we may not be able to develop much in the season, but as long as everything is the black, we're not running in the red, we cover our it's overhead. A it's a success for us because at the end of the day, this is all of our jobs and this is a business. And this, you know, what better way to, to you know, have a job? What better job to have? Yeah, I was just thinking because, um, Right. Williams never took tobacco money. Right. Wasn't that. So he had to be good at hustling for money because that's what everybody else used. He took yeah. alcohol money, but not tobacco money. Right. So I don't remember. I, maybe that's only recently. Yeah, I just maybe. remember. I mean, even recently would have been in the early 2000s because they banned it when like 406. I don't know. I just feel like that. Because I remember when they took on Martini, that that was one of the yeah, things yeah, that, yeah. that they. Um, I, I'm. I, I'm sure. So again, somebody's yelling at the radio right now or not. Well, you but... could be right. I, I sh I'm trying to think back through the liveries of Williams and remember. And I know that's what I was doing too, right? <laughs> like, on it. I, I, yeah. I, anyway, I'm going to stick with that. But you'd have to be, yeah. right? Um, even if that wasn't your primary sponsor, right? Because that was everybody's right. primary sponsor, right? That was in yeah. your, you know, your Ferrari Marlboro, right? Like that was everybody. <laughs> your team barf one, right? It was in every, it was a, a, a title sponsor for everybody. So um, and to remain a privateer and to always kind of stick to that gun. I think that's always what, uh, talk about ride or die, right? Like yeah. Frank ride or die with that, that concept of being a privateer, um, mm -hmm. not compromising that, not, um, to his detriment. Cause I, I think the team really didn't ever succeed again. You're right. After, after BMW and them split, it never was, um, and that's, it's almost like, I was just thinking too, like as a person, it's kind of like living paycheck to paycheck or maybe like two paychecks to paycheck. You know what I mean? Like yeah, there's yeah, just like yeah. barely a paycheck out of poverty, right? Or something, you know? So I, it just always seemed like they were always going to be on the streets any moment now and that they were just barely eking by. And, um, you know, even when it's that much exorbitant money, it's still, you're just trying to keep the lights on and that it isn't any way to really run a team. Yeah, it's a very oh. difficult way to do it. And um, and so for that reason, you know, he, he got pay drivers in. You had Pastor Maldonado, that, that oddball <laughs> one-off win with 2012 uh, when they brought um, uh, Maldonado in. That's strange. I wonder what's causing all the accidents. Um, it's so a great had, moment. Yeah, so they had that. But it was, um, yeah, it was very difficult. And then you start to look at, at this started kind of around 2004. It was really about the succession planning at this point um, that kind of happened between 2004 to 2019, 2020. And there were several sort of moments during this time. As time went on, I think Pat, both Patrick and Frank began thinking about succession planning. 
And first right. there was Sam Michael who came in. Oh yeah, I remember him. Remember Sam Michael? Yeah. You know, nice enough guy, but wasn't really a designer. Um, yeah. was more of an engineer. Uh, that didn't really work out at the time. And, um, and uh, as a replacement for Patrick Head anyway, uh, it didn't really work out. And then um, uh, Frank brought in Chris Chappell at the time as the CEO, but that didn't work out as a replacement yeah. for Frank either. Um, and those first guys that would be stepping in to fill the shoes of, of icons like Patrick Head and Frank Williams, you know, that was always going to be a tough job for Sam and Chris, you know. Um, right. So that didn't work out. And then in 2010 and 11, the team brought in a guy named Adam Parr. Now, mm -hmm. Adam was a bit of an eccentric. Um, he was a unique individual and he, he wasn't winning friends up and down the paddock. And in particular, he wasn't uh, particularly well liked by Bernie Eccleston. And right. uh, so much so that uh, he was canned and because Bernie apparently called Frank and said, you got to get rid of that guy. Guy's got to go. And so Frank got rid of him. <laughs> and, uh, and in hindsight, having read that God awful book of his, um, yeah, I agree with him. Uh. Um, so that didn't work out with Adam. And then Adam, I think later said some controversy. I don't know. He is a kind of a, a unique individual that Adam. Um, so then, uh, in 2012 and 2013, Frank stepped down from the board and then brought in Claire, his daughter, instead of his son, uh -huh. Jonathan. And I remember at the time that raised a lot of eyebrows because Jonathan, you know, was a, you know, dyed in the wool racer Formula One fan too. Um, right. And so they brought Claire in instead of Jonathan. Um, and in hindsight, I think it was always difficult for Claire. And again, I, I, I go back to that Williams documentary and watching Claire and kind of what she's going through. And I, and I felt, you know, bad because the situation that she was in, because in hindsight, she was effectively trying to manage the fall of Williams, despite all of her hard work to rebuild and grow the team. And it, it, it just become insurmountable, the task, yeah. you know? Yeah, and difficult for her. To yeah, the, to find the you know, money and all that. She's right. She's paling that water out of that boat as fast as she can. Right. That's exactly right. Or yeah. she's trying to like put the the cement to keep the wall up as it's crumbling down on top of her. Right. It was never. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Um, and then in 2015, so that was 2012, 2013. Then in 2015, uh, with Claire now in charge. Oh. Uh, with uh, uh michael driscoll so in 2015 the team brought in pat simmons remember ah. and now you remember in 2015 this is pat simmons coming back after his ban from the sport yes for pat simmons role in renault's crash gate with right. fernando alonso what was that 08 mm -hmm. so he was banned from the sport so williams rolling the dice first team to say you know what he's paid the price what the heck let's right. bring him back He's not banned anymore, so they brought him back. Now, by all measure, that should have worked, but Simmons, uh, Simmons was very candid with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Claire and Frank about what it would take to get Williams competitive again. And to be honest, I don't think the team had the finances or investment partners at the time to make the kind of changes that I think Pat knew was needed in order to be the kind of team that he wanted to run. Right. And so Pat left, right? Yeah, and you never know what what he was told, you know, or what like yeah, what situation, right. you know, because certainly he had to know that Williams was in a dire place. Yeah. You know, so so the fact that he got there and went, "Oh, you're in a dire place. I'm going to leave." Well, that that's not news, right? If we knew yeah. that, he right. certainly knew that. So I, I I think it would be interesting to know how did they convince him to do this if if right. it was always going to be uh Never was going to go. Wow. That, yeah, that does it. That's just not good. Although it uh, did, it did uh, coin my favorite Will Buxton from, I think it's the first Drive to Survive where he goes, see you later, Patty. Yeah, right, <laughs> that's right. right. Because <laughs> he's going to get blamed for everything because that's part of his role. It's, you know, the, right. the sort of like technical director person is the, is the coach, right? And so it is yeah. where it all falls. And yeah, see, see you later, Patty. Right. So. Yeah, so in 2017, to what you're talking about, the team brought in Patty Lowe. 
right. uh, as the team boss. And it wasn't right. just a team boss. They made him a shareholder too. They made him everything. That yeah. was, I mean, I remember that was a big, see, now we're getting to like, not only did I watch, but my memory also somewhere in here still is able to function into 2017, right? That hasn't completely been squished out of my brain, but right. That was a, that was Patty Lowe. That was such a big, yeah. that was a big thing. Cause that was really everything possibly is on your shoulders. Like <laughs> yeah. that was, that was never going to work either. I mean, they were just throwing everything. I think that was the other thing too. I think at this by 2017, they really were just, you know, it wasn't just like a, a noodle of spaghetti, right? It's like the right. whole pot and let's see what sticks. They're just really trying everything. And that's, that's not good in any, anything. It's right? not. And in especially, business. you know, and so Patty Lowe, who had just been sort of canned yeah. unceremoniously by Mercedes. Yep. Um, so then they brought him in as the team boss and shareholder. And that was a horrible situation for Claire mm -hmm. to manage. So they brought in Mike O'Driscoll. Um, and they, you know, they had canned, you know, Patty. All right. And, uh, and then that drive to survive where Patty <laughs> walks up, interrupts Claire. Claire didn't even acknowledge that he's standing there. That She's so having bad. this conversation. He's just kind of standing there awkwardly waiting for her to end her conversation. She just kind of glances over him. He's, hey, Patty. Hi, yeah. Claire. <laughs> We got the but we flew the parts in, you know, last night on in coach. You know, it's like okay, great, thanks. Right. Yeah, that was that was oh yeah. That was awkward. hard. That was, that hard. was yeah. hard. And I yeah. think even just watching, like if you only watch recently or you only watch that race, there's about it was painful, right? And so yeah. I mean, you've just marched through all this history, and you didn't, you know, and you've kind of gone more, um, you know, the 2000 more current stuff. And so like if you think of how they're winning ways, and watching that it really is it was really you're absolutely right if you look at the right? dichotomy between that versus what they were it was right. night and day what that team yeah was, right? yeah night and, day. and um <clears throat> yeah so tough and so there was also some real missed investors missed uh, uh opportunities with investors mm -hmm. as well um they completely missed the investment opportunity because Total Wolf came in in 2009, he invested in the team and became the executive director. Right. But they didn't make the right moves with Toto, right? This is Total yeah. Wolf. So right. Toto says, all right, well, he leaves, goes over to Mercedes, and then dominates the sports for the last six years, right? Yeah. And even the way he, Total Wolf tells the story, like he wasn't, he didn't want to go. You know, it's not like Mercedes yeah. said, hey, come, come do this. And he's like, all right, I'm out, right? Like I, yeah. it was a hard, hard choice for him to leave Williams. Um, you know, I was wondering too, is that I wonder how much in this time, just this seems like a very broad statement, but like things changed, right? Like mm -hmm. Frank really was successful in the, like, you know, two martini lunches era of the world, right. not so successful in the, like, we don't drink during lunch anymore. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So I think it's, I think some of that, um, Williams perhaps never. And the fact that they always stayed a privateer was always going to be hard, right? Yeah. Like, if they were never going to turn to customer cars, th this is always it's going to be stuck. And I think that, again, I'm sure for the moon time, and this would be on the bingo card too, is like, yeah, we all we all want privateers that's in our heart, but Frank, this is crazy. What are you like? <laughs> what are you doing? Right? Like, this, you're not going to succeed anymore. And so I think that, um, I mean, I certainly don't want that to be the legacy. I think the legacy is much more that he stuck to it, right? I, if you would have listened to oh, me, yeah. I would have told him in, you know, 2004 or five, like, yo, this, this boat is sinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, hu hubris, there's two sides to that, right? Like it's what made him successful. And it also could have been right. a downfall. And in his, in his world, he, you know, Formula One was his world. So he didn't have any, any plans to stop. You know, no, and he right. was going to stop when he physically stopped, you know, um, right. And that's the kind of guy he was. And then there was, a, you know, there was another opportunity in 2016 with Lauren Stroll. Mm -hmm. So Lauren Stroll got connected to the team via buying a seat for Lance. Right. Right. So he came in, bought a seat for Lance. He offered to buy controlling interest and was turned down by uh, Claire and Mike. And he went on to purchase Aston Martin and invest millions, tens of millions of dollars in this team, right? Which could have been Williams, 
But I think there is that element, like you said, maybe a little bit of that hubris, whether it was Claire or or, or right. uh, Frank or both. You know, they the thought of them giving up controlling interest. I don't think that sat well with either of them. You know, no, no, and and I mean the thing is, is that this is their empire. It's their baby, like, right? I could see how hard that would be. Like I don't know anything that's even remotely like something like that, but I could see, you know you have all this success and you've worked on this team and, and even from like Claire's perspective, how many years of her life did she, yeah. uh, of that relationship with her dad, did she lose because her dad was working on this team and then over her dead body, she was going to sell it out. Right. Like right. I could see how that, that the human, like I said, hubris, but like that human pride that, you know, that, and I don't mean that to be uh, that they're foolish. I don't think that's, that's no. what I mean, but um, you know, that, they were just really stuck to that and that's what they stuck to until the end really almost and uh yeah because it was a family dynasty you know and they were the last ones i mean yeah, i think right. you, you watched them all fall off and and certainly they probably saw the other you know it's not like a smooth sailing for everybody else either so right 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 so they had this opportunity with lance uh, or lawrence stroll that didn't yeah. quite work out um you know that uh, that was difficult to navigate. I think Claire uh, did her best uh, to try to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, I've been around Claire. I didn't meet her when I was in the paddock, but um, uh, but yeah, I, you know, certainly, certainly Although, uh, for, to, to Claire and the yeah. entire family, our condolences uh, oh. uh, for sure because it's a difficult time. I I can't imagine Lawrence Stroll at Williams. Like no. that just seems like a that that is talking about a clash of cultures, oil and water, right? Yeah. Or like you know, yeah. oil and vinegar. Like goodness, that I could that just right. I don't know. That was just like, whew, that just seems like uh yeah, that wasn't gonna work. Even if they were willing to say, you know what, the future is what it is. We have to we have to sell the team to somebody. I I just can't see how that's gonna really fly. Lauren Stroll is a very uh strong personality yes he is yep yep and i think you're right in saying that things change i you know i think when bmw left that was the beginning of the end the sport had changed quite a bit um and it was difficult for them to to sort of stay on top of that um yeah you know i think back of uh, another inflection point for the team is uh, 1992 um with mm -hmm. their active suspension now to be fair absolutely it was lotus that kind of got the active suspension started but it was williams who perfected it in 92 and 93 and they had back-to-back -back titles those years and here's the dichotomy about this in in the sport in particular as a privateer who was winning, Williams had the funds to actually innovate. And they innovated right. this incredibly good active suspension that other teams couldn't afford to do or couldn't afford to develop. And because of that, it was deemed as a complex technology out of the reach for smaller teams and therefore banned along with most of the other electronic driver aids. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Williams, a privateer, not a manufacturer, a privateer was winning so much that they had the money to innovate and create and perfect the active suspension system that was deemed by the FIA as too complex of a technology. The smaller teams couldn't afford to build their active uh, suspensions, and therefore they banned it. It's an interesting refrain and one that the FIA took seriously. But when you look at it juxtaposed to today with the Mercedes domination yeah. with a over the top expensive hybrid engine, which small teams cannot afford. Right. Right. Uh, and they can't afford to innovate it. They got to go in, hat in hand to the manufacturers. You know, can I please right. can I have a Mercedes? The FIA right. is completely silent and has been for seven years now. And perhaps if the FIA had made a similar move to protect the small teams, Williams now today would not be in this situation or have faltered as much as they did had and, and would have more money to innovate. So, you know, my how the mighty have fallen. They were the ones mm -hmm. with the cash and innovation. Now today they don't 
have the cash and innovations. They're one of the small teams that can't afford that complex technology. And it's just kind of interesting how that flips on its head. If you will. Yeah. Nope. That's just my thought. But I'm I think it is a know. it is a cautionary tale. Like I think it's, I mean, maybe it's just because they've existed in the sport for so long. But you know, I think that there's a lot, a lot to be learned from the the travels and traverses of Williams, both through mm -hmm. the '90s when they're very successful, into the 2000s, and then, you know, sort of the more recent times where they haven't been very successful. Um, right. And what is that? You know, like you know, like you win today, you know, it, but no tomorrow that, you know, it may not, not roll the same way. So. Right. Um, right. Well, in the end folks, it all comes down to results, right? <clears throat> and yeah, the results absolutely. are this nine constructor titles, seven drivers championships, 114 race wins and a legacy that is unparalleled as a privateer. If you consider right. People like Ron Dennis, Ken Tyrrell, Colin Chapman, Bernie Eccleston, Paul Stoddard, Peter Sauber, Jackie Stewart, Bruce McLaren, and many, many others before them who defined the sport and made it what it is today. Frank Williams would be right there, chief among them, as one of the guys that defined the sport the way it is. The era of the privateer was defined by men like Sir Frank. And today, yeah. honestly, think about this. If you're newer to F1, you can look no further than Dietrich Mateschitz and Red Bull as this era's most prolific privateer. And that's, folks, it's it's not because, you know, yes, I just like that picture. That's why I have that Red Bull and I drink Red Bull. But it's Ferrari's my team. But here's the thing. That's why I get very defensive when people get completely dismissive of Red Bull and said, oh, don't let the door hit in the butt on the way out. If you don't like the rules, leave it. Get out of here. You'd be better off with Red Bull. No, 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 no. No, it wouldn't. They're continuing the legacy that Sir Frank created as a privateer, a non-manufacturer building their own cars and winning races. That's what Frank did. Frank was the blueprint for that. Ron Dennis could be argued was the same, right? So don't dismiss those people like Red Bull, like um, Gene Haas and, and Haas F1, right? Uh, Alpha Tauri, uh, because those are teams, and even Sauber, yes, it's got Alfa Romeo on the side of it, but it's not a manufacturer. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, have a little, a little deference for those privateers because it's not easy. And uh, Williams is a, it's a testament um and red bull was at the pinnacle grace four championships in a row mercedes pulls the rug out from underneath them mm -hmm. with a hybrid engine right? right and and they've had a baked in advantage and they go oh, you know, well, really it's a really close season oh is it because now all they're doing is turning the wick up and lewis is mopping the floor with people right now so if you look at they fell and they're marching back you know to take the fight to mercedes at least um that's not easy to do. I think when most people react to Red Bull, they're reacting to Christian Horner. And maybe at some level, Max Verstappen, but... Yeah, right. You know, right? So I, I think that's part of it, too, is that, like, of course, I mean, especially Williams, you think of Frank Williams, right? Because they have the, the name, right? Like, but I think that, um, and especially because Red Bull doesn't have... Um, well, they got Helmut Marco. Helmut Marco, Marco. Helmet. Yeah, he's been great for them, too. But I think <laughs> that... Um, you know, any great company, you know, like when Apple moved to a new CEO, right? And Tim Cook took over, you all hold your breath, right? Mm. Like that first step away from whoever is your team principal the first time to whoever it is the second time. And that's, I think that's true in every organization because it could be completely different. And so I think yeah. we've never seen Red Bull without Christian Horner. And I think Christian Horner um, has grown into being the evil villain on the pit lane. Um, I think he's always kind of been that way, but, um, you know, I think that now with, uh, you know, drive to survive, he just lives up his like, you know, Karen Horner persona. Um, but I think, I think most of that haterade is more at Christian Horner and how he carries himself. Um, because he isn't very Frank, like, you know, it's not like 
It's not like he's the only one that's on the on the horn with Michael Massey. They all are. Oh, it's yeah. just his persona in doing that is um yeah. You know, well, it's I just forceful. Yeah, it's always important because you could get in if you're a Red Bull fan or Ferrari fan, you get bent about Mercedes or Toto or whatever. Sure. It's easy to do, but don't lose sight to all the men and women that work for those teams who work their tail off uh, to try to uh, to make that team a better team. Yeah. And that goes for yeah. every single team up. And it's easy to say Gunther yeah. Steiner and Haas and ha ha. Haas has got, you know, what a joke, couldn't develop the car. There's a lot of men and women working for Haas. They have a lot of pride yeah. in that team and they work hard with the resources they have. And it isn't easy. And um, same for Williams. Yeah, I think that, um, so two things, right? Lewis speaks that a lot that, you know, that, you know, he realized that, you know, if he wins, not only is, does he get a bonus, right? But so does everybody else at the factory, mm -hmm. right? Like other people benefit when he does well and that that's something that drives him. Um, but I was also thinking, I think it's in Steve Matchett's first book when he talks about minority and like, it makes sense, right? Yeah, I'd work at Ferrari, that'd be great. Why does anybody work at minority, right? Like right. why would anybody work at a Haas, right? And how he talked about how um, not only is a place like a minority, a stepping stone for a driver, right? Like mm -hmm. George is at, you know, Williams and he's going to Mercedes. Right. The same thing happens for all the, you know, all the engineers and the mechanics. You started a lower level team and you move um, up the grid, but that, that is your, that's your season. That's your family. That's your, your team. And so the idea of just thinking like you're a minority, you're a bunch of losers. They don't think that way. And um, neither does Haas. And that of course we, um, team principles, especially are very visible next to the drivers, right? Who do you know? Again, it's just like any other sport, right? You know who the quarterback is, you know, who the coach is usually, right? right? Because they're that first line non-player that we all know and that you see, and you see them on the sidelines and you, you know, right. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And calling the play. So I think that's the team principal plays that same sort of role, um, that is very visible. And so, um, it really can drive the, what looks like an ethos of the team. And so that's why I think that Red Bull often gets caught up in Christian Horner-ness and that that's what people <laughs> react to. And I don't think Max Verstappen-ness helps that, right? Um, yeah. Necessarily. So. Yeah, could be. Well, anyway, that's what I uh, yeah. was thinking about, uh, Frank. I think. And, um, yeah, ahead. absolutely. No, I just think, yeah. I think that I was, um, I like everybody, you know, I was shocked, you know, it was just like, Oh, let's see what's happening on Twitter. Right. Like it was just, um, you know, I, I think that he's been, if you've been watching the sport for any amount of time, um, you, you have a connection to Frank, you know, it's not like I know him. I've never met him. Right. Like I know him from the documentary. I know him from reading articles. I, you know, I know, um, of him, I don't know him, but I think that, um, I think everybody has a warm spot for Frank that's ever yeah, been involved sure. in the sport. So I think that um, it speaks to who he is. It speaks to the legacy of the team, um, you know, and that uh, yeah, everybody has something, you know, some touching story, like, like you're saying, like just reading people's stories or even, um, yeah. you know, like some of the new, like Lando Norris, who's like, I never really met Frank, but you know, I've heard all these great things about him. Right. You know? So right. I thought that was, um, really sweet. I think it's what we'd all want, uh, Twitter to remember us all by, you know, or these are the things we'd want us all to, you hope you leave the world, uh, with that kind of an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of impact, Grace, um, this is a great segue. I thought you were going to go is. with Lando. Speaking of Lando Norris, but no, speaking of Lando, why would yeah. we do that? Uh, okay. so Lando says, Lando Norris says, this is hat tip ESPN. Lando says, uh, that with fame comes the creepy side of social media and how some fans do very strange things to even those around Lando, like his friends and family. He said, quote, there are, when they were asking him, are there, you know, weird incidents like that? And he says, there are, it's very, very weird. Honestly, it's very creepy what some people do. The time they spend trying to investigate things or people or whatever. I just laugh and find it very funny, but it's very weird. It's just odd, end quote. He said that uh, it's weird even when you're out doing normal things in life, like going to the bathroom or going to the loo, as, as Paul might say. He said, yeah, you know, standing in front of the urinal, you know, in the bathroom, he says, when they look, it's like, OK, that's weird. Then they look again because you get it. You get a lot. You know, you're you're standing there. Um, 
and they take a second look and you look back and that's massively awkwardness and uh and so then he says that so they're standing there talking to you and you're like oh f bomb you know yeah. Oh, yeah. f uh yeah. so he end quote but he said yeah it's like really really strange um to be in that situation and and uh and he, you know he's at that he's at that that point grace when he was young plucky teen uh, you know, a little, uh, uh, um, you know, twitch.com gamer turned Formula One driver. Now he's like the rising British star along with George Russell and everybody recognizes him. And so he's right at that point in his career arc where it's going to be difficult. Like Lewis could tell you now it's difficult for Lewis to go anywhere and not, you know, be mobbed. Um, right. but yeah, he's at that moment, and I think those are going to be weird. I think, you know, I, I don't know. Look, I think most fans mean well. It's just that mm -hmm. they're a bit struck by meeting Lando in the bathroom. Um, yeah. and, and to <laughs> yes. be fair, who wouldn't be? I mean, if you went in, you know. I certainly would be. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I bet you would. Yeah. Um, yeah and it's a little weird. It's like uh, when I was at in Austin and, you know, when I hit the, uh, the, yeah. the elevator and open up and walk in and, you know, there I am. And I'm standing there with uh, Pastor Maldonado. There you go. Hello, little man. And I'm like, uh, hey, Pastor, how are you? He looks at me like squits, like, should I know you? You know, and he said, oh, doing yeah. well. You know, we had a delightful conversation. You're a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, drives so for shit, but it's a nice guy. Yeah, you know, it's right. Uh, you know, I don't know. Look, I've always treated celebrities no different than I treat other strangers or friends. I, I really it, don't. I don't. But I think, them. oh, I'm sorry. I think even, you know, doing this podcast, right? We've been doing this for eons and I'll meet fans. You know, we'll be at a race or somewhere and we'll be talking to somebody or we do a fan gathering and people know things. And I'm like, well, I never told you that. No, but I told you that, right? Like, yeah. so. And so I could see where that's kind of weird that you think you're having this. It's just you and an interviewer and you're just talking about stuff or you're talking about the things you did today. And somebody's like, oh, how's your cat doing? Right. Like, why do you know that? Oh, right. Because I that's what I blathered on about for 20 minutes in our last show. So I can see even just in that, like, you know, it it's weird. And social media is only, um, you know, sometimes makes that weirder because I realize that sometimes people know things or they know parts of things like the cats is what made me think of this but like if somebody has an event a baby or a surgery or something like that people will only catch parts of it in their feed right they don't they don't go to your page and read the whole yeah, story right. they just get your post as they show up in their feed so then i was like i'd have to ask people well, what do you already know because i don't know what you know because you only caught parts of it and then me telling you i can tell you everything or i can tell you nothing so i think that i just as a regular person right that has this podcast that we've been doing for eons i now can't imagine what it'd be like to be covered in rolling stone or racer or something like that where lots yeah. of people are reading this interview and you want to be authentic you want to be open but you also have to be guarded and i think that is like you i agree with you right that he's at that precipice of like lando norris who the hell cares to like lando norris people care and so yeah, yeah. um trying to figure out where that boundary is for you um what stories you share, what stories you don't share. Um, and that, yeah, people, yeah, people just ask weird, people are weird. I mean, people yeah, ask Some people are over things. the top. I mean, I just, I don't get awestruck like that. I don't, I mean, I've met a lot of famous people in my day. And in and, 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 and terms of Formula One, I'm not just in an autograph, you know, line, but <laughs> right, you know, right. I've been interviewing them. I've been in, you know, press situations with the media and, and uh, with teams and and uh you know spent a lot of time with uh, with a lot of the drivers and stuff like that i i have tremendous amount of respect for what they achieved in their careers right. uh, absolutely it's not that i i marginalize that of course i don't a uh, tremendous amount of respect but um uh the celebrity status i think i think in a lot of ways um I, I find that it's not their celebrity status that makes things weird. It's the fans' reaction to their right. celebrity status that make it awkward. So, like, for example, um, when I met Sebastian, mm -hmm. um, I followed Sebastian his entire career. I've met him a couple times. Uh, super nice guy. Yeah. Great conversation. Um, but I know a hell of a lot more about Sebastian 
than he right. does me. He doesn't if he doesn't know me from the the bellhop at the hotel, right? Mm-hmm. And and yet I know all these intricate things about his right. life, his career, what he's achieved, and so it is difficult. I quote the the late uh, Neil Peart, whose lyrics famously said, "I can't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend," and right. um, and in the song Limelight, which is very true because people have a tendency to feel like they know you, they right. know these people. That we watched Drive Survive. I saw it. You know, I know what right. you're like. You know, and they really don't. You know, and uh, so yeah, that's that would be a little awkward. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna. But add not to at I, the urinal, or as Paul might call it, a urinal. Oh right. Yeah. No, that is right. There are rules about those kind of things. No, I was yeah. thinking. Um, I saw an interview recently with Kevin Durant, uh, the best NBA NBA basketball player. That um, he was talking about how his relationship with social media, and he's like, yeah, when I first, you know, sort of got into NBA, and I took it all personally. Like people would tell me, you know, whatever, and I take it really personally. And he's like as I've had, you know, more experience with being, you know, famous and being this basketball player and social media, he's like, I realize people just want to make a connection. So yeah. people will say things, uh, you know, he didn't say it will troll me, but that's, I'm going to summarize it that way. People will yeah, troll yeah. him just because then he reacts. And then it's like, Oh, I made Kevin Durant mad. Look at how great I am. Right. So well, that even, was not my intent. When I said, happy birthday, Christian, it's tomorrow. That was right, not right. my, that was not people, my intent. And I, think I did get a reaction. You sure did. And it, and it will be a, a key phrase forever on this podcast. I, but I, think I need to get a people, shirt that says it's tomorrow. People will always, I mean, we're, that's what humans are always trying to do, right? We're always trying to make connections. We're social mm-hmm. people. And um, it's, it is, it is weird it, when it catches you off guard or it's somebody that you're like, I think that's somebody famous or, um, you know, you do just get awestruck by somebody that they've been doing something and i think we're all just really trying to figure out how to like um awkwardly interact with each other and that's all we're really looking for and so i just that's what came to mind is that kevin durant really kind of went through that same ebb and flow and he kind of had to realize that like now i just don't take it personally because they're just trying to get a rise out of me for fun because they're just trying to make a connection right that's, that's so what anyway, uh, hey, in other news, your team quickly, uh, McLaren yeah. takes control of an IndyCar team. This is a hat tech motorsport. The tie up between McLaren and the Aero Schmidt Peterson motorsport motorsport team uh, started back in 2019, but they are now official with McLaren announcing the finalization of their 75% controlling interest in the team, which effectively means that McLaren have an F1 team and an IndyCar team, folks. That's right. That makes sense if you consider Zach Brown loves American Motorsport and in particular loves IndyCar, no doubt. No secret about that. Perhaps this series will also be a nice junior series from, I say that lovingly yeah. from the view of an F1 fan. Sorry, IndyCar. But they may look at it as a nice junior series um, in which to develop young talent like Pato Award. Or perhaps uh, move drivers from M- F1 into IndyCar to make a run right. like Daniel Ricciardo. Run, maybe he could run at the Indy 500. Who knows, right? Um, Works so, great for Alonzo. Why not? Why not? Uh, there is one part of me that wonders if or when a McLaren might look more seriously at sports car racing like the yeah. IMSA series, as Zach has a lot of friends in that paddock too, and I'm sure he loves that series just as much. Uh, but that would be really a direct link to their road car division. Um, and I got to think, okay, so maybe the road cars isn't paying for all of it, but at least all the fun and frivolity of F1 and IndyCar, but it's, gosh, you got to think that road car division has got to be paying for some of the overhead and at least the square or the round building. Right. I think mostly the rectangle building, right? Like maybe. that's the one they're paying for. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, the one with all the thought leaders. That's the one. They're right, paying right, for. right, right, right. Yes. I like it. Um, so anyway, there's that. Also, uh, Jeddah, that's where we're going next in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's an unknown track. Hopefully. Yeah, I know. Uh, head tip Autosport on this one. Carlos Sainz said he believes that the Jeddah track will seriously compress the midfield of the grid. And with Ferrari, McLaren, and Alfa all having their certain strengths at different tracks, this track could flatter each of them in different parts of the track. Uh, he said, quote, the, the last few tracks, it's a bit unknown. 
Obviously, Jetta, we have no idea what we're going to find there. It looks like a very high-speed circuit, and when we have, uh, and when we have seen in high-speed circuit that cars like Alpine, McLaren, and AlphaTauri, all of a sudden the field compresses a lot when it's a high-speed circuit. So it could be very tight battle in Jetta. Then in Abu Dhabi, when the new changes they've uh, done to the track also, it looks like it's a higher speed track and that uh, than it used to be. Uh, there's less chicanes, more high speed nature, and this also could bring the whole mid-pack together. So he's kind of viewing this last couple of races as really compressing. That's interesting. The designer of the Jetta track says that in their mind, it's way too difficult right now to know if this is an obvious Mercedes circuit and and it might work against Red Bull. It's too early to know. Um, because, because it's not finished? Because it's not finished. <laughs> they haven't figured out where to put the trash containers and, you know, all that good stuff. So, you know, I don't know, man. You should have done what uh, Bobby Epstein and uh, and uh, Tavo oh. did down in Austin. Just hire the Australian Grand Prix folks to come in and handle the event for you because they, they're pros, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway... Time will tell as we head in. I say at least we do know this. We know that Lewis Hamilton does very, very well at new tracks <laughs> just yeah. like two weeks ago. And right. uh, that is always a factor. Always a factor. So you keep that in mind. Oh, yeah. Lewis is uh, a new man now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Rejuvenated. He is gunning. Um, I don't know. So, I don't know what they're feeding him, but yeah, he's a. Uh new man now so He's turn that wick up. i don't know i Merc. think i think you know watching guitar they remind me and especially because they're deserts so there's like no natural landscape but they just always remind me of like when you first start playing the sims and it's like day <laughs> two of the sims and you've built your track you have a house but you have no trees you have no decorations you have no garage right. it's just right. like a track and stuff and so i was like I mean, I watch MotoGP. I'm familiar with guitar, but it was just like we should never show this track without the with the lights on. Never see this track in the daylight because right. there's nothing around right. it for there's miles. Nothing. I know just there's this track and there's it. no there's some grandstands. So I just think it's like here we plant some trees. I mean, I guess it's kind of how all the the desert tracks are, and that's an, a whole extra element. But I just always feel like they look like you know I just started playing The Sims. Look, my people stand over here. That they don't have a house yet, you know. <laughs> right. I don't have enough money yet. I don't oh, have any that's stuff. Funny. So we'll see. We'll see how that yeah, goes. We'll see. we'll see how it looks. And uh well, you know, a new track, it's always new fun. New track, yeah, who knows? It mix things up. All right, let's let's do some Alvin's cats. Seriously, Todd. Stop killing it, Todd. All right, Grace. What do you got in Alvin's okay. cats? Well, I feel like since I haven't been on for like seven weeks. I just wanted to give a quick recap of the last four races okay. um, and my, my non-racing highlights. Do it. Um, because I know that you guys already covered the racing highlights. I don't need to talk we about did. that. See? Because mm -hmm. I know this is what you guys do. But the non-racing highlights, I don't know. So I thought in Austin, I think my favorite moment was definitely Shaquille O'Neal standing on the podium and maintain and remaining on the podium as if he, and, and because he's so tall and the drivers are so short, he looked like he was in first place and that Lewis was in third and Max right. was in second, right? Like he looked like he won the race. Why he still stood there, who knows, but it's Shaq. And he talk about being weird and awkward. That's what he, like, who's surprised? He rolls up in this giant vehicle and just stands there. And who's going to tell him otherwise? Who's going to be like, right. excuse me, Mr. O'Neill, you need to stand over here now. You need to get out of the shot. Yeah. I'm not telling Shaq that. So, uh, but I did love the whole, as an NBA fan, you know, I did love the whole, uh, you know, Chris Bosh and, and having basketball there. And um, I thought that was great. So I really enjoyed, um, Austin was great. And that was a great vibe. Um, Mexico a boring race as always. And yet Max Verstappen seemed to make the most entertaining podium of the year boring as well. They're rising you out of the, out of the ground. Could you pretend to be excited? Could you pretend that you just want to race? Nope. He looks just as bored as we all are. This is the <laughs> only highlight of that race. And you continue to look boring. Personally, I think that they should have just put Kimmy up right. Just for one last right. time, let's just bring Kimmy up out of the stage and see what, right. see what happens. Right. Right. But, uh, yeah, Max, try to look a little more excited when you're winning and they're bringing you up out of the ground like that. <laughs> um, Brazil, my favorite non-racing highlight about Brazil was 
So they gave him these laurel wreaths when they won yes. that were super awkward, which, <laughs> of course, I love because they kind of put them on and it was like, they kind I of know. look like a, a wet cat, like, oh, what do, I yeah, do? Yeah. what do I do with this thing? And then so I, I know that you're also a big uh, Ted's Notebook fan as well. And so the Ted notebook, you know, he's just wandering around, you know, the back and it totally does look like a mall, you know, like an outdoor yeah. mall in like Arizona or something. So he's just like wandering around and he, he spots in the Red Bulls or in their little um, uh, motor home, the laurel wreath, like on the ground up against the wall. And he's like, they're going to throw that out, aren't they? Well, like, so if somebody didn't think of that, like, how are they going to get it to Qatar, right? Like, what are you going to do yeah. with this giant lore? With right. it back to the factory? Do you send it to the next? Who's packing right. this, right? So uh, that was a very good uh, logistics question. But he's just like, are you going to throw that out? He's really obsessed because that's part of Ted's charm is it that, is. like, he sees something and he just, like, seizes on it. So then Alex Albon brings it out to him and they have this whole funny exchange about the laurel wreath and that Alex Albon tries to get Ted to take it and Ted's like, no, you should take it. <laughs> and um, anyway, I enjoyed that because I don't know who made that, who thought that was a good idea, who made that decision. Well, they're doing that. They're doing that with the sprint races because that's oh, how. Wait a minute, have they done this before? Two other. They did. did they do yeah. that at Silverstone. Uh huh. Yeah, they're oh, doing totally the the, the race with totally uh, the sprint it. races because it's a oh. nod to the old school. Because the old school, they always did race. It is way. right. I get that it's yeah. old school, but I right. didn't. I thought it was just a Brazil thing. I didn't realize it was a sprint race thing. Yes, it's a sprint oh, race thing. Shows you how, yeah. how close I'm. Like, yeah. Bought in those yeah. mailboxes over here, yeah, right? Yeah. Eagle eyes. But anyway, I thought that was really funny. And those wreaths are really giant and awkward. And, yeah. um, and you know, and I agree that while we're on sprint races, Brazil is the only place you can have them. So unless you're going to have six Brazils next year, I'm not a fan of the sprint races. But yeah, that's just me. Um, I think it works there. It's a short track. It's kind of fun, but um, I'll let it go. Um, and then finally, we get to Qatar, and uh, not only is it a track you should never see in the daylight, but Alonso, P3, yes. yes. Alonso, 2022. That's right. <laughs> uh, I can't spin all the way around. That was a bad idea. <laughs> That's right. So, I yes, I was very Come excited. The rest of the race. <laughs> yes. I was very excited as you, as you, um, all, all you longtime listeners um, will know that, you know, for like every year since 2004, next year is going to be Alonzo's year, right? right? So, um, yeah, so there you go. We're back on the uh, Fernando Alonzo, That's young right. driver, Fernando Alonzo for 2022. So I'm Alonzo all 22. That's right. I love That's it. That's right. It's going to happen. Good stuff. Um, so. The only thing I get, oh, I had a, um, a big shout out. To my friends Ilya, Darren, and Trevor, um, I had a wonderful chat with our uh, top patrons uh, supporters uh, over the weekend, yeah. and uh, so it's all around the world, right? So I did it at, and I did send out a, a notification to all the top patron supporters out there, and so hopefully you got those emails. If it, if uh, if the email address, if you're a patron supporter. And and you used like a junk email that you never check again. You may have missed it. Um, but anyway, I sent that out. Uh, we did it at uh, what five p.m. Eastern Standard was it nine or ten? Um, yeah, I can I barely do the one hour difference between you and me. And now you want me to do like yeah, London? Think, yeah, I think it was four o'clock my time plus six to GMT, which is right. ten, and it was like nine a.m. in Australia. Right. So we covered most of it, you know, uh, as best we could. So anyway, and we had uh, people represented, uh, but it was uh, a wonderful chat. Um, and uh, just it was a great opportunity to, to tell them how grateful we are for all the patron supporters and how much we appreciate. And we could not do this podcast without them. Yep. Um, but then we, we segued and we talked about the current season, kind of got their opinions and their thoughts and they shared some thoughts on the podcast and, uh, it was a wonderful conversation. So we're going to plan on doing these more frequently, uh, probably around that same time frame day, 
uh, Saturday over the weekends and, 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 you know, try to do it at a time that most people from around the world can join. Um, but anyway, a great chat and we'll do that. So keep your eye out. If you're, uh, one of our, uh, top, uh, Patreon supporters, uh, keep your eyes out for those emails and announcements. And I send a zoom link and, um, to our zoom channel and everybody joins and we have a good old chin wag and, uh, it was a lot of fun. So thank you for doing you that. Go to those guys and um yeah so that's my alvin's cat i don't have any mail i do have an email um from like what like snail mail what other kind of mail do we get well i well good point um mr um mufti uh okay. it's r-a-y-a-n i'm gonna mispronounce it because i'm a yankee and that's what we do so it's rayon um i did get your email um, and, uh, it's a great question I want to ask Paul. So I'm going to save that one, oh. uh, for, for Paul. It's, it's one of those technical questions that you and I'll scratch our head at. Um, so I anyway. can make stuff up, but yeah, no, I can't too. Answer. Yeah, I can too. I can <laughs> get into, well, yeah, cool. Rayon, it's the Kawanda effect. Uh, you know, no, I watch I, a lot of ESPN. I can, I can wax poetically and say absolutely nothing with the best of them. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, um, but we'll be back next weekend uh, to do this all over again yeah. and talk about Jetta, and that ought to be a lot of fun. And uh, and we'll see. Oh, by the way, the Patreon men, I asked them, all right, so if you had to put a marker down, Max or Lewis, and they were like, whoa, oh. we all thought it was going to be Max, but now everybody's thinking it's going to be Lewis. So, well, I think it's going to be Lewis. Yeah, Never uh, count out Lewis. No, you can't. Not when uh, Mercedes has been sandbagging with her engine all season. <laughs> no. No, I do Turn like somebody po up. Somebody posted a picture of like George Russell and it was like like 10 seconds after Abu Dhabi. I'll take my keys now. You know. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right. Like, exactly. Yeah. That's the yeah, other he'll be, he'll be ready to test. That's for sure. Yeah, he's he's ready. He, like yeah. that seat's not even going to get cold. Both nope. eyes can just get nope. out of there and uh that'll be just fine. George is ready. Right. All right. Well, that does it for this podcast. Be sure to stop by the website, theparfermay.com. Share your opinion. Just do it to Corman Civility, as always. It means no personal attack. Huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you like this podcast, go over to iTunes and give us a good rating. Show us some love over there as well. And until we do this over again next week, talking about the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix, uh, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camber, saying so long, Grace. See you in a couple weeks. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.